In the icy wilderness of Antarctica, there was a peculiar rock. Amidst the vast, smooth, and snowy landscape, it stood alone like a dark smudge. This rock had been there for ages, untouched except for occasional snowfall. Roberta Score, a lab manager at NASA's Johnson Space Center, had spent countless hours in Antarctica, searching for rocks just like this one. Antarctica was an unexpected treasure trove for these discoveries. These rocks were easy to spot against the blindingly white ice. Why was it so important? Because it wasn't just any rock. It was a meteorite that had fallen from space thousands of years ago. Roberta's rock, known as ALH 84001, was initially unimpressive. However, it turned out to be extraordinary. It was a piece of Mars. The rock's chemical composition perfectly matched the surface of the red planet. Turns out, it had been blasted off Mars during a colossal collision millions of years ago. It was wandering through space before landing on Earth. There, it had remained undisturbed for a very long time. Scientists at Johnson Space Center carefully examined this Martian visitor. Years later, physicists made a remarkable announcement. This meteorite contained tiny structures that looked just like living organisms found on Earth. NASA immediately shared this discovery with the world. We found fossilized evidence of life on Mars. However, as other scientists got their hands on the rock and conducted further studies, they began to doubt it. Yes, it was a fascinating piece of rock, but Martian chemistry might create similar structures without life being involved. So, unfortunately, it wasn't conclusive evidence. But all this debate raised a very important question. Would we recognize extraterrestrial life if we saw it? There are more than 200 different definitions of life in scientific literature. So, what should we be looking for? To figure out what makes something alive, scientists have come up with three important things that living things must have. First, living things need to store information about themselves. This information tells them how to work and what they're like. It's a bit like having a set of instructions for how they function. Second, they need to be able to interact with their environment and create reactions. These reactions help them get energy, move around, and respond to changes or dangers. Lastly, they must be able to make copies of themselves, reproducing, and making other things that are just like them. This ability is a big part of what makes something alive. The famous physicist Erwin Schrödinger was one of the first people to figure this out. He said that storing, using, and passing on information is super important for life. It's like a cycle. Information helps create reactions, and some of those reactions let living things make copies of themselves. On Earth, we see this in action. We humans, for example, have DNA to store our information. It helps us with our evolution. Thanks to all this, we can adapt to our surroundings over time. Nature sees that some traits are helpful for survival, so they stick around, while others get left behind. In other words, a way to define life is by saying that it's subject to this process called Darwinian evolution. But how did it happen that things capable of evolution appeared? And when did the very first life emerge in our universe? To find out the answer, let's go to the very beginning of everything. The beginning was the Big Bang. Right after it, there were no stars or galaxies. The universe started as a mostly even and empty place, with just a tiny bit denser than the rest. After the first second or so, first protons, neutrons, and electrons, among other particles, appeared. And just about a couple of minutes later, these protons and neutrons came together to make stable atomic cores. Then, everything was a super-hot soup of particles for about 380,000 years. It was way too hot to form anything dense. The universe needed some time to chill. After it calmed down a bit, it let electrons join these cores, forming neutral atoms for the first time. Ah, finally, some comfy temperatures. If we were there, we wouldn't have needed the sun to keep us warm. That cosmic background radiation would have been enough. Could life appear at this point? Mm, probably not. In those early moments after the Big Bang, 
The universe had only hydrogen, helium, a tiny bit of lithium, and almost none of the other elements life needs. Life as we know requires things like water and organic compounds. So it wasn't about the temperatures, it was about the ingredients. Now everything had to form over time from these atoms. To create something like a planet, which is much denser than the universe on average, it needed a lot of time and gravitational squeezing. Gravity is the real hero of this story. It changed the universe completely. Even though it started slow, it kept going and got stronger. Regions that were a bit denser could pull in more matter, and the denser they got, the more they attracted. The very first star should have formed around 50 to 100 million years after the Big Bang. These stars could become incredibly massive, hundreds or even a thousand times bigger than our Sun. And when these stars formed, it didn't take long, maybe one or two million years, before they disappeared. Just for comparison, our own Sun is 4.6 billion years old and still going strong. When huge stars reach the end of their lives, something incredible happens. They transform helium into carbon, then carbon into oxygen, and oxygen into a bunch of other stuff all the way up the periodic table. Then the star's core collapses, causing a massive supernova. This huge BAM releases all these heavy elements into the universe. Hooray! Now the space is filled with something new. The universe acquires many cool things, including the ingredients needed for rocky planets and organic molecules. Each generation of stars gets even richer than the previous one. Yes to more elements. It means more rocky planets, more essential ingredients for life, and more chances for complex organic molecules to form. And now, when the universe was around 300 to 500 million years old, rocky planets were already popping up everywhere. Great. Can we have some life now? Hmm. That depends on what we see as life. The recipe for life as we know it needs a special ingredient, carbon. Carbon is special because it can bond with other atoms in so many ways. It can connect with different shapes to build all sorts of amazing complex structures. It's carbon that helps us form things like DNA and proteins, which are the building blocks of living things. Now, while the universe made rocky planets relatively quickly, it took a bit longer to get enough carbon floating around. It appeared about 1 to 1.5 billion years after the Big Bang. As soon as it appeared, the universe finally had enough conditions to create life as we know it. Which is why scientists are searching for planets around these oldest stars in the universe. These guys definitely had enough time for evolution. But just because you and me are made of carbon and other elements from exploded stars, doesn't mean that all life should be. Scientists are open to the idea of alternative biochemistries. There might be non-carbon-based life that we don't know about yet. For example, blobby beings made of silicon compounds. It's carbon's neighbor in the periodic table. So when and where did life truly begin? Unfortunately, we don't know for sure yet. Most likely, the universe started preparing for life shortly after the first stars formed. And if all life is carbon-based only, then it should have appeared 1 to 1.5 billion years after the Big Bang. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. Looks like it had plenty of time to evolve lots of microorganisms. So even if we made a mistake, and the mysterious meteorite was just a piece of rock, we shouldn't give up. The search for extraterrestrial life continues, and who knows? Maybe in the future, we'll finally know the answers to all these important questions. Until then, stay tuned. If you could track the line of evolution and go back an exceptionally long time ago, you'd see some weird creatures called Ediacarans. It seems like these little fellas made of tubes showed up 579 million years ago. They thrived at the bottom of the ocean for about 37 million years, chilling and minding their own business. It continued until they disappeared, or better yet, turned into faint marks we now only know from the sandstone fossil record. The world started to change for these ancient creatures somewhere around 541 million years ago, when a lot of new life forms came into being. 
some new creatures began to evolve, and it's possible they might have replaced our friends. They might have changed the environment in ways that made it hard for these poor fellows to survive. Why does this even matter that much? It was the first time when a complex life form went extinct because of other living things. Usually, when you hear about lots of creatures vanishing from the face of the Earth, it's due to something like a giant volcanic eruption poisoning the oceans, or a big space rock slamming into our planet. For example, 440 million years ago, a big change in the planet's climate happened. The water in the oceans became colder, and it wiped away a lot of ocean life. The southern part of a big landmass called Gondwana ended up covered with ice quickly. This made a lot of Earth's water turn into ice, which, again, caused the sea levels to drop. Creatures from that time were struggling to find food. Plus, they didn't have homes where they could evolve, live, and reproduce. Then there was this interesting period called the Age of Fishes, when a wide variety of different sea creatures appeared on Earth. Even though some animals were starting to live on land, most of the action and fun was still in the oceans. At least until the moment when trees and plants ruined the party. Their roots started growing on dry land and it transformed the world, turning rubble and rock into soil. This was fun for land animals, but it gave all those fellas in the ocean depths a lot to worry about. The soil, rich in nutrients, got into the oceans, which made a lot of algae grow in the water. These blooms eventually caused enormous dead zones, where algae took away oxygen from the water. So lots of marine animals that were simply fine living their peaceful lives in the ocean couldn't breathe there anymore. Plus, they didn't have enough food to survive. Or we can talk about the biggest extinction event called the Great Dying, 253 million years ago, when almost 90% of all species on Earth vanished including many land creatures such as insects, reptiles, and amphibians. This happened because of insanely strong volcanic eruptions. When you see what happened in the past during these extinction events, you can understand better why the case of Edicarians is so intriguing. Researchers haven't found any evidence that low oxygen levels or some other troubles that might have happened in their environment could have caused them to disappear. Also, they've agreed that conditions weren't that bad, since the creature's fossils remain intact. They look for answers in southern Namibia, studying rocks that contain fossils from the time when ancient creatures vanished, and new ones came to the scene. Researchers found many traces of these new ones left behind. Modern animals are like architects of their environment. They change things around them, dig into the ground, and eat one another. But if they caused ancient creatures to disappear, the remains of those species had to show some signs of struggling, something the fossils from Namibia indicated. Traces were similar to predatory sea anemones. Well, you know what I'm trying to say. How did tiny, simple cells even turn into such complex organisms anyway? Throughout time, they got bigger and ended up with nuclei and mitochondria parts that help cells work, but it's still not completely clear what really happened here. The most accepted theory is that mitochondria, which are like the powerhouse of the cell, came from a kind of bacteria that got inside another bigger cell. This bigger cell started to change over time, developing more parts like the nucleus. This way, a cell became stronger and more complex. That sounds cool, but we can't be sure of this. One of the problems with this idea is that we don't see cells in between the simple and complex stages. There's also a new theory that says that the first step toward complex forms of life involved a bacterial cell that formed bumps on its surface. These bumps trapped similar bacteria, which then helped the cell get bigger. As it grew, the bumps turned into parts. And some of these parts later turned out to be useful, such as endoplasmic reticulum the outer nucleus membrane. More and more parts started developing, which meant increasingly complex forms of life. And the most complex known creature that we ended up with is this tiny transparent water flake. It has 31,000 genes, which is 25% more than what humans have. 
This water flea is especially interesting because it can transform its shape when things get tough. It can grow spines, helmets, or even teeth depending on its surroundings, and this might be because it has so many genes. Scientists copied its genes, and instead of staying the same, they quickly changed their roles to adjust to the environment. Researchers believe the copied genes would stay the same and only change later, so this was a bit of a surprise. And this interesting creature even has some genes like ours. This may help us understand our own kind better. For instance, how humans react to different threats in the environment, and how we can improve things that negatively affect our health. Or imagine if we could grow some of those cool additional organs, like this water flea. The first complex forms of life are older than we thought. 1.6 billion years ago, there was a happy community of small, bright red things that looked like plants. It was flitting around in a shallow pool of ancient waters and eventually ended up trapped in rocks and preserved till the end of time. A few years ago, scientists from Sweden found these fossils in India and concluded that they could be red algae. Using a special method, they carefully extracted them from the rock and discovered two types of red algae, one that looked like a segmented noodle and the other with layers of cells. To understand them better, the researchers made 3D models of them and used radioactive dating to confirm their age. If that's true, they're almost half a billion years older than we previously thought. A very long time ago, our home planet was hot because of all those things slamming into its surface, like asteroids and comets. This made it difficult for life to start there. But about 3.8 billion years ago, these hits slowed down, and life finally appeared on Earth. At first, those were simple life forms. But then, more of these space objects hit Earth. And it's possible some of them brought water and other stuff important for life. Some life forms survived these hits and finally had a chance to evolve. However, we still don't have unambiguous evidence of how it all started, so no one is sure if life on Earth appeared just once or multiple times in unusual ways. Our planet had building blocks, which are elements important for the appearance of life, even a long time ago. These blocks could have appeared naturally or might have come from space rocks. As they join together, they form more complex things, like proteins, fats, and DNA. And maybe this process happened more than once. Someday, we'll find the answers because it will help us understand not only our planet, but the odds of life emerging on other planets too. So, you pay a few thousand bucks for a ticket, then fly on a private plane to a remote island with dinosaurs. A tour bus takes you through a graded field. You hope to see live diplodocus, velociraptors, tyrannosaurs, and other really big lizards. But it turns out that this park is full of a new species of genetically modified dinosaurs. Look, a massive tyrannosaurus with feathers and a beak is running around. This Diplodocus has large ram horns, and the Velociraptor has a short ostrich tail. All these monsters look like a big genetic mistake. They live in captivity and entertain rich people. And then you ask yourself, do we have the right to interfere with evolution and genetics to make dinosaurs for fun and profit? And is this the main question before making a real Jurassic Park? Why do we need to do this? But before answering it and seeing the consequences of such a park, let's find out how close modern technologies are to this. A company called Neuralink created a special chip and installed it into a monkey's brain to allow the animal to manipulate the computer with the power of its mind. One of the startup's co-founders said they had the technology to create Jurassic Park. Many people and fans of the famous movie were pleased with this news, But scientists say this idea isn't so cool. So if people are going to bring back dinosaurs, it can lead to unexpected results. This is not cloning or recreating lizards from a preserved DNA sample, but creating new species with the help of breeding and genetic code of dinosaurs' descendants. As a result, we can get lizards that have never walked on Earth before. We have whole tyrannosaur skeletons and fossils of other lizards, so what's the problem? Well, scientists can extract DNA from them and grow a dinosaur. But it's not so easy. 
people can recreate extinct animals or replenish the population of mammals on the verge of extinction thanks to fresh samples of soft tissues and DNA stored in laboratories. But the dinosaur specimens are several tens of millions of years old. There are some molecules of life that remain that archaeologists extracted worldwide. Still, they are all like pieces of a big puzzle. This genetic material is not enough to recreate the entire dinosaur code. Genetic material begins to go bad as soon as life ceases. And now, imagine how many different upheavals and weather conditions one dino skeleton could survive for millions of years. At first, it could burn because of a fire. It could get underwater and, after that, fall to the ground where it spent an eternity before archaeologists found it. Almost nothing remains of the genetic code. However, one company called Colossal decided to try to recreate the ancient animals using the DNA found. Only instead of dinosaurs, they wanted to bring back a woolly mammoth. According to the authors of this project, mammoths can be helpful to the planet. They can fertilize the soil with their manure, filling it with valuable elements, ensuring good growth of meadows and other things like that. To implement such an ambitious project, scientists use mammoth bodies well-preserved in the cold tundra. But it turned out that there was not a single living cell in them. Scientists couldn't clone a mammoth based on preserved DNA. But the company had a plan B. They decided to find the missing pieces of the DNA puzzle in the woolly mammoth's closest relative, which is the Asian elephant. Using full-fledged living cells with DNA parts of mammoths, scientists hope to edit the genome and create a new, perfect animal. They plan to remove one detail from the DNA of an Asian elephant and insert a mammoth cell there. The new mammoth may have a thick coat, hard skin, a thick layer of subcutaneous fat, and other functions necessary for survival in the cold. And what if we do the same with dinosaurs? If the pieces of the puzzle can't be preserved in dinosaur fossils, Then you can find them in the DNA of other animals, the modern descendants of the formidable lizards. For example, a modern chicken and an ostrich may be direct relatives of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Look at the running chicken and a computer model of a moving dinosaur. You could say it's poultry in motion. They're similar in some ways. In addition, the structure of the skeleton of birds is similar to the skeleton of a T-Rex. But crossing the genes of a dinosaur and a chicken is quite a perplexing task with an unpredictable result. Scientists needed to rewrite the gene to endow the chicken with some reptilian properties. As a result, they recreated the dinosaur-like teeth and hands of a velociraptor. In this way, scientists can get chickenosaurus. But how many variations can appear from a test tube during such work? Many T-Rex with a chicken beak. Or imagine a feathered velociraptor, or an ordinary chicken with a toothy beak and scales instead of feathers. What if a chicken's body demands meat, but its brain stays vegetarian? According to scientists, such operations may require about 500 animals. What to do with them after the experiments? What if many of them are born suffering? And all for what? So that people can come to the zoo and look at mutant chickens? This is a gross intrusion into the natural process of evolution. If we create a new species, how will it affect the rest? What if mutant dinosaurs break free and increase their population, destroying the local fauna? Many scientists want to know more about dinosaurs without creating them. We think we know everything about these lizards, thanks to the movies and documentaries, but there are many mysteries around them. How could they support their heavy bodies? How did their lungs work in the distant past when there was twice as much carbon dioxide in the air? Is it true that dinosaurs produced enzymes to get more nutrients from plants? Researchers claim that it's unnecessary to interfere with evolution and conduct genetic experiments to answer these questions. But let's imagine that in the distant future, scientists managed to create dinosaurs from the genome of birds and other animals. And these dinosaurs look pretty normal, without any mutations. How will the planet change? Well, firstly, there would be many theme parks and zoos with live dinosaurs. Initially, only the rich would be the main visitors to these places. But over time, the prices would drop and allow ordinary people to visit dino parks. Many would want to have pet lizards. 
you probably saw how a tiger or another wild cat lived in the house on TV or the internet. So imagine that people will keep small jumping lizards, like these guys, in their apartments. Dinosaurs would live on huge farms or reserves. There would be vast ranches with a herd of triceratops or stegosaurus. People would train many lizards and make them helpers in agriculture. Instead of a pack of oxen, you could see Diplodocus plowing it away somewhere in the fields. Also, there would be dinosaur races. People would make billions on dinosaurs. But eventually, all this would lead to disaster. Some dinosaurs would have started living in the wild, increasing their offspring and taking out other animal species from the fauna. This would lead to an ecological catastrophe. What if ichthyosaurs or plesiosaurs got into the ocean and increased their population? They would quickly destroy other marine life. People wouldn't be able to sail on ships, as one sea lizard can easily turn over a small vessel or bite it in two. People would have to face great danger. In this case, the billions earned from the dinosaurs would be spent on fighting them. And it would be quite difficult, since dinosaurs have thick, rough skin, strong jaws, and muscles. And what if people accidentally created an intelligent species? Imagine that a T-Rex would appear who would decide to start a revolution against humanity. In this case, we could lose first place in the food chain. And then people would realize that Jurassic Park was a bad idea.